Keep the biometric nut um, beyond persuasion. And I think here we are trying in this innovation platform, we are trying to rethink all available tools. And obviously neuroscience is putting under question mark many of our research tools. Whether we like or not, probably the people who are here are with me that with some of the tools can be reconsidered. Uh, first, uh, if I ask you about how big is our conscious mind, the, probably the image that comes to your mind is a famous iceberg. And this iceberg, this old metaphor from Freud, <laughs> Is it still valid? But I think Freud was quite generous because when the BBC asked to some neuroscientist to draw in a piece of paper how the same questions, how, how big you think is our conscious mind? And these people were walking every day with brains, in vivo brains, as you would see. I can't show you the video, but I'm going to show you the images that these people draw on the, on the this piece of paper. The first image is this lady, just a line, then this corner, then this bead, and the satisfaction faces is very important as well. This one was quite generous, but this one that is working really with the brains besides him wrote this small thing. So I think this is, this is very, very important because therefore, the, and we come back metaphor about uh, conscious brain and we come back to this. Actually, the conscious mind is just a tiny, tiny thing in the, in the top of this iceberg. But, and this is the, the, the paradox, the conscious mind is simply not running the show. However, we have created an entire industry pretending that it does. And while uh, and I think it's, it's quite funny that on the other, in the other uh, track, traditional market researchers are talking about the system one, system two. System one, that is this unconscious, is this automatic thinking, and people are pretty happy to listen to this. However, all our tools are asking to system two. So therefore, there's a big, big paradox we should come back to neuroscience to ask why is this is happening. Obviously, we know that this is happening because there's a lot of money into the, into the story. But going beyond that is that the research industry is keen to defend, in a, in a way, these existing approaches. Obviously, they are saying, well, well, you know, maybe we can enhance some of the tools. We can change the way, the, the way that we are asking people but more importantly, and this is what Walnut and I myself are, are really defending, is that I believe that all of these approaches can be fundamentally reconsidered. And that's why, as well, because as Walter was really well explaining at the end of his presentation, emotion, just because of the etymology of the word, emotion means movement. And emotion is the only one who's going to be able to predict behavior, that this is the ultimate market research has as an industry. And because emotion, this links to the, our unconscious. Emotion is not verbal. Unconscious is proceed in this unconscious mind. And this is why, what, what's happening? Yeah. Problems with... Um, you could have told me before. Now you can't hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's depending on the movement. So if I look in at you, then it's fine, I think. If I look in at the... Just look at you. Just look at you, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, all right, so and our research approach, the one that I want to talk to you about, it doesn't talk about, or just, it doesn't talk about awareness, recall, or likability. Because awareness, our brains can capture a lot of information, despite it's, they are not, it's our minds are not able to relate about all the information. Recall, 
I think recall is not enough. It's just not enough because recall, it doesn't matter if you cannot recall something, it doesn't mean that has not an influence on your behavior. How many times people said, oh, advertising, sorry, it doesn't affect me. But we know how people exposure to any advertising um, stimuli has an influence. Otherwise, marketing you know, wouldn't in invest the, the, the amount of money that it does. And likability, sorry, likability, whether you like or not a commercial, is not a predictor that is going to change your behavior. So that's why our approach, it talks about, and all these neuroscientists colleagues that are here, are talk about, is talking about emotion, and how emotion is able to predict the behavior, which is the main subject of market research. Now, I'm going to talk about our research approach is trying to combine both areas of research. First is neuroscience with the tools that also Walter uh, was talking about, EEG, GSR, and eye tracking. So it's a mix of uh, the activity in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then, and I'm really defending this combined approach where we are using qualitative and observational research to understand completely the complexity of human beings. So we need both lines of research to really complete the picture. This commercial, for instance, is a nice example about what I want you to, to, uh, to talk about. Well, I don't know why it's No, yes, Michelle, yes. The, the first bit is talking about relevance. And this relevance is the emotional, the emotional valence. And this emotional valence is, this is a very, very sad commercial, but it's extremely effective because it was providing information about this approach behavior. And this is, again, people in a focus group were saying it's very sad. And people, because of our survival, always avoid negativity. And this commercial, we didn't know was if, if, if it was going to be effective because it was very sad. And we said, yeah, come on, but go beyond that. It's not just important to say it's sad. I want to know if it's going to have an effect in your behavior. And actually, this is one of the most effective commercials in the Polish history of commercials for this. No, yes, Michel, yes. Yeah. Did you stop to you Tysiące polskich dzieci są ofiarami przemocy w domu. Wspieraj kampanię Dzieciństwo bez przemocy. So in campaigns that are trying to change behavior, this emotional um, information is providing an, an, a more, much more information, a more reliable than just people's declarations. Because this is how the brain works as well, trying to, to avoid explaining when it's sad or when it's something that they cannot explain beyond the words. This other example um, is another point that I wanted to make, that is how we can use these tools to, uh, to go again beyond people's declarations but complement them. In this case, it was a commercial for Fiat Bravo, and the client asked to which scene would you recommend to use after for print and outdoor campaign. And, but as you will see, the music is utterly important in the commercial. So it's quite difficult for consumers to isolate this music and tell us, OK, now this is the scene that is, gonna, is, is, is the highest, is, is the most relevant one. So let's watch the commercial. Molti mari e fiumi attraverserò dentro la tua terra mi ritroverai turbini e tempeste io cavalcherò volerò tra i fulmini per averti Nowy Fiat Bravo z gwarancją na milion kilometrów i w kredycie 0% przez 3 lata this red, in every, in every of the, the little words that I show you so far, this red means positive, so this approach behavior, while this, um, this um, yellow is neutrality, emotional neutrality, and when you will see as well this blue means this negative or avoidance behavior. 
as you can see here in, the, in this commercial, the scenes that were, if we, with these techniques, have, um, uh, allow us to have this scene by scenes analysis. And then we can see here that the four, these four scenes were the most relevant ones. But again, if I come back to the question of the client, which is the scene that I, I can use for my printing campaigns and my, for my 360 uh, gaze campaign. And therefore, what we did is to compare with music and without music. And here, first, we show the commercial with music, and after, we show without it. And it's the way that we have to isolate one of the, the main, probably the, the, the one, the, the element that is causing the relevance. And then we had three scenes from the four that we came from. These three scenes, when we analyze these three scenes, the first one is the opening scenes, that this, it, which was quite intriguing, but not enough to differentiate the brand in the automotive market, right? And, but it was very important because this scene was how the commercial was opening, and it was giving us a clue about how it was going to standing out from the clutter, which was quite important as well. The second scene was involving an extra layer of sense, so this sense of touch was very important from a sensory point of view because it um, was able to trigger more emotion than just the visual or the, the audio. Um, and the third one was engaging as well. You could see that the level of engagement was quite important, but it, it was um, automotive, um, if someone is, is working in this uh, category, it's quite difficult to differentiate a car from the back. Yeah, and particularly in this segment. So therefore, the scene that we choose, as you could see here, or the one that we briefed to the creative uh, agency, was this second scene. So how this extra layer of this, this touch was providing the most engaging uh, one. And actually, was used in the salons with the car, where all these people that were working with the one were showing and using this. And this, in a way, was triggering the memory at the point of sale, so at the moment of this decision making in categories as this one that is a high involvement category, right? But now, uh, coming back, and I think it's where neuroscience can provide answers and some missing links that I think we haven't done in the past is how to make the correct links between consumers and shoppers. And I think this is important because then is when we started to talk about these emotional drivers of shopping. Uh, Charles in the morning when he was talking about how people behave in a store through all of these kind of multiple choices that obviously is causing this paralysis of choice, right? But how we have here uh, Mrs. Wilson, and Mrs. Wilson has to make a decision about which product is gonna, she's going to choose. And um, probably market research has often relied on the fact that this person is going through a decision tree, because all of us have seen these decision trees. So she's making, she's like calculating the pros and cons of each decision, is trying to look for the format, the price, and many, many other steps. But if she would have done this, if every day that she does this, actually would take her 14 hours to make the shopping. And I think a, a lot of, I think most of us have many other things to do rather than being in a store for 14 hours. So what, she, what we have demonstrated with uh, neuroscientists is that actually we use some visual cues, very simple ones, that are color shape. This is from our uh, eye tracking. That it just allow us to have a clear idea about which is the product. And then in the subject, it's happening something that it's what we call these attributes from the brand that is telling you something about your identification, what people can actually report. I like this brand because of these reasons. But also, and more important, there's something that triggers this final choice, which are the memory and emotional processes going on. And this, we saw this with fMRI. We can see that people actually, all of these processes are really filtering the final decision making and the price, for instance, this kind of rational uh, point is less important when you have a brand that has this emotional packet, a big emotional packet, because then emotions can become shortcuts for brand decisions. 
And the emotional packet, obviously, is, is very complex. There are many, many factors that have influence on this decision-making. And the brain captures this in a very, in, in a non-linear way. And this is what we should understand. So not just the links between consumers and shoppers, but also how we can trigger this in the, exper in the experience with the brand, because it's the only way that we can have a kind of favorite, to have a, a good, position into the consumer's brain and obviously provide value into their lives. And that's why I have been um, trying to demonstrate that really, guys, the, the way that we think, you know, these rational and lineal models has to change. Because decision trees, these persuasion models don't work. And we need to go beyond that. We need to think that human beings are far more complex than we like. And obviously, our life now is more complicated. But this is the future, right? So let's crack on. Thank you very much. Questions? Is my time for? Any questions? David. Yes, I'm curious. Um, back in, quite some years ago, it used to be that positivity and negativity to a running stimulus would be assessed with something called dial testing. Huh? Maybe you know it. People get a meter, you know, put people in a theater, you give them a little device with a yeah. knob. And they literally have it's a self report technique. Yeah. I like, I don't like, I, I wonder how the results of Idea, but it's just because I've seen the other dial test trackers yeah, and they look yeah, yeah. yeah, but this is not a post rationalization, it's something that is of happening course. at the same time, right? Of course. Well, what we do with that is that um, I not, I'm not comparing. So, when we first we run these biometrics in this approach, and once we have this, um, this uh, biometric trace, what we do is to prepare the whole diagnosis, uh, the whole uh, discussion guide based on this, and then we go to the consumers after and ask, look, I'm not going to tell you whether you had a, you know, a pick here or a pick here. What I want to know is that you explain me a little bit more about this reaction. And it's the way that we are going deeper. But we are not, so to, coming back to your point, we are not trying to, to counterbalance you know, what they would declare and what my results are. You know, despite it seems, you know, if you are familiar with this kind of thing, it's, it's totally different. And now what we are trying is to complement conscious and unconscious information in order to have a much better picture of consumers because we know that our stimuli as well are very complicated, right? And from the science perspective, you know, when they do this kind of test, the elements, the stimuli are less complicated. Here we have sound, we have music, we have a lot of images that change rapidly. So it's very important to have also this conscious information that uh, help us to interpret the data. Because I think, as we said in the morning, facts, you know, there's, um, there's no facts, there's interpretations. This is a big, big interpretation as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David.